All right. So uh, next up, we have Veronica, who's talking to us about Internet of Things, uh, the key to rooting the human being. Hi. Is, can everyone hear me? Okay. So should I stand normally or on my toes? Okay. So my talk is not a presentation. It's more of an interactive conversation. So I'm going to ask some questions. And I'm hoping you're going to talk back, otherwise I'm going to put people on the spot. I'm very good at it. So, I'm going to speak about the Internet of Things. It's the buzzword. It's the sexy word. It's, it's what's new in InfoSec. But has anyone heard about a smart hospital? It's a horror show, in my opinion. They are planning to connect all medical devices to a single cloud service. So that anyone, a physician or a nurse, pharmacist, radiologist, can have access to your information. So let's start. Who am I? I'm V. Please don't call me Veronica. That's reserved for my parents and my husband when I'm in shit. So generally, be nice and call me V. I am a Gen 1 cyborg with a passion for breaking things to make them work again. So I have a pacemaker. This is why I'm passionate about medical security. Not to say someone's going to hack me, because I'm, I'm really not a target. But it's something that can affect the future of someone out there. Because who can tell me, if the first medical device is hacked in a human being, do you think someone else that's got a heart problem is going to have one implanted? No. So what happens? Life expectancy is lower and we die younger with curable diseases or something that can help you live longer. So now my question to the audience, should medical devices be put on the Internet of Things? No. Okay, so you buy a TV. No. No, we're not. But the thing is, we need to identify what is convenient versus what is not just safe but secure. So it's not to say this is doom and gloom. This is to say we're going to talk about what's wrong and how we're going to fix it. But now I'm going to ask you this. Well, I'm not going to put my heart on the internet and I'll explain to you later. And then you wouldn't want to do it either. So you buy a flat screen TV. So you buy a flat screen... <laughs> Okay, so that might be right for someone that's not in my shoes or someone that doesn't have a neurotransmitter. You're sitting on the outside thinking, oh, it's never going to happen. Well, Dick, Ch Dick Cheney replaced his pacemaker with an older model due to him having wireless controllers. But it's a theoretical threat. That is what the vendors are claiming and that is what they're sticking with. So... As I'm seeing it's going to be interesting. I'm enjoying it. Carry on. So I'm not going to go and everyone can read the Internet of Things. What is it? We all know what it is. Do I need to clarify that? Okay. So medical devices. <laughs> medical devices is basically most of the devices in a hospital. And those are the devices the doctors use to remote monitor you to ensure that they can identify problems before they happen. That's what is used to do tests with, and so forth. Okay, so now on most hospitals, and, and, and this was done on a questionnaire basis where we actually discussed this with hospitals, to say to you, what's on your wireless LAN? The MRI machines are on because for firmware needs to be updated. And I can promise you, someone's not going to sit and physically do it. They're going to remote push it. That is how the vendors update. Your insulin pumps. Who knows how an insulin pump works? So it remotely monitors you and then can adjust your dosage according to parameters that your doctor has set to give you the right dose of insulin. But this is then connected to a home device that is connected to your Wi-Fi 
that communicates back to the doctor. So that's the insulin pump. And it's a good thing because it ensures people are getting adequate medical care as they need it. Because I, for example, I know a diabetic that doesn't look after himself. He doesn't check his sugar. So he easily goes into a coma. He's just not responsible enough to do it on his own. So insulin pumps in that case would be very good. Then robotic surgery arms. Who knows what that is? That is what they use to do precision surgical work. And that is done by setting specific parameters. Now, these also need firmware updates, which is also pushed across the network. And the same with your CT scanners. And your heart pumps, for me, yeah, is a very important one. Those things are put in your aorta, and it's what pump your heart. So those things are all in the wireless land in a hospital. Dialysis machines, infusion pumps, pacemakers, and then the worst of them all is the latest trend in medical devices called remote home monitoring system. It's a little device that sits next to your bed that communicates with your implantable device, communicates back to your doctor. So they can do telemedicine. So my doctor effectively can access my pacemaker, authenticate with it for the universal token, and see what's happening. If he then sees something needs to be adjusted, he can do it while I sleep. But it's also connected to my Wi-Fi. And we all know home Wi-Fis are not very secure. Yours might be, but the general public, not in security, are not as conscious as we are. Now, I watched a video on YouTube where they explained the concept of a smart hospital, meaning that you would be given a single card that contains all your medical data that you would scan at reception. It would identify which room you would go to, what treatment you booked for, and that would communicate with sensors placed like a Fitbit or a medical device that you wear to Tell the doctors what your state of health is. For example, if you have high blood pressure, it would identify where you've got spikes or where medicine's not working. And it goes so far as to say that it will be integrated with a pharmacy. So you'd unlock your medicine as you're supposed to take it. It will then give you a certain amount, and everything is integrated. So your physician never has to see you face to face. It is all done electronically which is not a bad idea, it's convenient. But I don't think that convenience should trump security and safety. And that is the stand that I'm taking. It's, it's fine to have convenient medicine, but it should be conveniently safe and secure medicine. And we shouldn't give that up just because we don't want to go into a doctor's office. So this is what they are planning on doing, having everything integrated into a single system. But we all know the healthcare system is not known for having the best updates or firmware or security. We've seen it with the events. WannaCry was an example that hit the NHI hard due to something that was easily fixable long ago. It's legacy systems, and that is the reason that medical security is lacking, is these legacy systems that are running and being forgotten about. This is the Medfusion 4000 wireless syringe infusion pump that is used for morphine injection in terminal patient, patients. Now, this was a study done by a UK-based company that have identified the following vulnerabilities in these devices. Now, it's your buffer overflow attacks. There's no certification on the devices, hard-coded credentials on the device itself, hard-coded passwords, passwords which are stored in the configuration field to make convenience easier for people to log in, and proper access control. Now, if you have a device that is responsible for giving morphine, these are not the vulnerabilities that you would want to see. Now, I know it's terrifying, but it's fixable. And this is what the vendor put out in public, remedial steps that hospitals can take. 
instead of redoing their firmware and spending the time in researching and actually having the code tested, they said that the hospital should just assign a static IP address. I don't really see how that's going to help. And I monitor for rogue DNS and DHCP, DHCP server traffic. Well, because monitoring has been working so well in the past. We're going to pick up things after they've happened, after a patient has gotten morphine in their system. Now, let me tell you, if you get too, too much morphine, you stop breathing. So that's going to be too late. Ensure network segmentation. And this is the most shocking part in hospitals. These devices are on the wireless LAN, but they're not segregated from the rest of the network containing patient details. So you get into a device, you get into the network. Using VLAN for segmentation is debatable. Applying proper password hygiene, because we all know that works so well when dealing with people. We choose the password the easiest to remember, or we write it on a sticky note. I spent considerable time in the hospital recently with a family member, walking around, watching workstations with username and passwords on sticky notes. I have pictures of it. Ask me and I'll show you. But to make matters worse was the network share path on there with their usernames and passwords. But the physician does not want to walk up and try and remember his username and password. He wants it the easiest and the most convenient way. They are there to save lives. They are not there to build a secure network. That's not their problem. But where does healthcare invest their money? State of the art healthcare. Not state of the art security. And that is the problem we're facing with healthcare as a whole. It's moving with technology, but it's not focusing equally on important parts. And then do not reuse passwords. And generally, most of these things, you can only use six characters. And no special characters as well. So, this is my real passion, is hacking pacemakers. And it's not to kill someone. I do really like human beings, but I want to fix it. So, my concept is, has always been, I want to fix the security without taking away the availability and accessibility of healthcare professionals. Well, imagine this, now I have an episode, I fall down. I'm not going to tell the paramedic, hey, wait, before I die, let me give you, let me give you your, my username and password. We all know that's not going to work. So we can't make it too strict or encrypt data if you're in a strange country and they have to access your device. So it's quite the conundrum on fixing the problems without cutting off opposition's hands. So uh, I think it would be ish. So basically, my device is an ICD, it's an implantable cardio defibrillator. So meaning, my heart stops, it shocks me. So if I do funny things, just know, probably got shocked. Um, <laughs> so let's, some of the work on the pacemaker's name, you would think, is it a good idea to have hard-coded credentials on a pacemaker? No, they do. Nine out of ten device manufacturers hard-coded their credentials on the device itself. And then you would think, okay, but this is not going to be in clear text or ASCII code. Well, I'm going to tell you wrong because it is. So, the firmware is not signed, which is generally a bad idea. So, meaning if I write something that looks like firmware, that matches where it's supposed to go, this device is going to open up and accept it. And it gets better. If you know how to do the handshake, there's no specific memory that it's written into or protected storage. It will just accept it. So this is my theory, which the vendor that I discussed it with did not enjoy. I write firmware. I go to a cardiologist. My cardiologist has got 500 pacemaker patients. It's in Bloom, so it's a small town. Can you imagine Joburg or Cape Town? These machines infect it. It then infects my machine to beacon out on the correct handshake with all medical devices and I'm still in the hospital. I reinfect 
other ones, and it beacons home. Now you've got a zombie army of human beings. Theoretical, you know? Or hypothetical, as my professor would say, would be the correct term to use. The file system is not encrypted on these devices, and these are both the doctor's programmer, the pacemaker itself, and the home devices. So who can tell me what file system we're looking at? This is Windows XP, which most of the programmers run on. And guess how you put it on? Just press the button, and it'll just come on. That's what the cardiologist told me. Mind you, I must say, my cardiologist thinks there's something wrong with me because I want to hack my own device. Not kill myself, but I'd rather kill myself than kill someone else. See, I am ethical. Now, this one's a big one for me. So any DevOps or anyone that does programming would say, you need to tell the device what it can accept and can't accept. Well, that is the good idea. However, medical devices, most of them don't have command whitelisting. So if it looks like it, smells like it, acts like it, it will do it. Now this grates me. So when asking the vendors why, they said, but we want power over security. Meaning our patients don't want to come in once every five years to have their devices changed, you know? So we can't have big computing power that's going to drain a battery. We want the batteries to last 20 years. Well, I'd rather go in every 10 years or five years and have the device changed, suffer for three months, but know it's safe and secure. You know, we can't just give up for convenience safety because we're not talking about someone hacking a computer rendering the services unusable. If you hack my device, which I will explain some of the attacks later, I will physically fall down and die. You don't come back from that kind of thing. There's no reboot, restart, you're okay, resuscitation. It's not gonna happen. Little comedy, it's not all doom and gloom. No one finds it funny. See, I told you, I'm not a comedian. Suck at it. Okay, this is a bit scary. It's called a crash attack. It basically means that your pacemaker is going to start doing some funny, funky, retro stuff. It's going to start pacing at unknown speeds. So once you have access to the device, which is fairly easy, after the fact, I will explain it to anyone that wants to know. Um, that was in a previous talk. It basically, if you know the pattern of the RF packet that it's expecting to see, and it's basically universal, the same across all devices, you, with a serial number, you could effectively gain access. It will say, okay, now if that looks right, what do you want me to do? So how it works is when you access a pacemaker, it goes into debug mode, which allows a physician to then program it. So it goes from debug mode to programming mode. Now, the very interesting fact is it stays open for two hours, effectively broadcasting and waiting for signals once it's been programmed. I don't know why. No one can answer me, but effectively that's maybe if your doctor changes his mind in two hours, phones you back, that he doesn't have to go through the whole process again. So when you incorrectly pace a patient, you can go from having a baseline beat of 60 to 120 to 170. And effectively, that's how it's going to carry on because it controls your top and your lower part of your heart. Then this is probably the most likely one to happen is where they drain the battery by basically overwhelming the system. So in regards to pacemakers, it counts one packet, two packet, three packet, and it stops at nine. Now, this is the interesting fact. You'd think... If you overflow it, it would say, okay, now after nine packets, something's not right, cut communication. It restarts at one. So effectively, keeping it on the whole time by sending immense amounts of packets, you could drain the battery life. 
if I was doing this, I would cut communication off the line. And you'd have to go into a physician's office to see what's going on with the device. These devices are made to go into sleep mode to conserve battery power and only be used as it's needed. And this is fairly easy to do. Okay, so that's the protocols that most medical devices use. How did I find this? On the internet, because you can download the part specification for every device. So this is how I did it, a bit of Google. Google's your friend. You go to the vendor the website, you download the read manual for the doctor, which you don't need a username and password for, it's freely available. You then get your part specification and you go to that vendor and download how it works. And voila, now you know. Ah, the replay attack. Don't, don't, for the hackers in the room, these look very familiar. Because we see it every day, we use it every day. I wonder if there's a Metasploit packet for Facebook <laughs> hacker. You know, there's a business model for someone. So, who knows what black boxing is? Most people. So that's how easy it is. Most of the hackers that have worked on this has used black, black box techniques. They reverse the protocols because they know how the demodulation worked. So they know what they see. They know how to put it back to what it was. Well, there you basically have got the keys to the kingdom. You've got the keys to someone's heart. Or neural stimulator, or gastric chip. There is so many medical devices out. There's even a pill now that you swallow with an amount of medicine that's wirelessly controlled and adjusted by a physician. Yep. No one said these things were spot. They might be convenient, but like I said, something should not be on the internet. I know we want everything on the internet, but there are some things that should not be. Okay, so basically the replay attack is reverse engineering the protocols. Okay, that's what I explained. There's no remedial steps. You ask them, well, how do you know if something happens on a pacemaker? What's your incident response plan? They can't answer you. So here's a hypothetical question for someone. Someone dies with a pacemaker or a neural chip or something happens. There's supposed to be trace evidence. And there's supposed to be a trace of an EKG saying, oh, you know, he had a heart attack, but there's no electrical stimulation. Then you ask the vendor and you say, so what have you got in place to identify these? No, we don't have anything because the doctors will rule it, you know, natural causes because he's got a heart problem. Where we should actually be pulling these devices, interrogating them, and actually seeing why they're failing. So the whole statement of no one to our best knowledge has been hacked is a statement made by legal to ensure no one gets sued because they've got no incident response plan. So they don't know if they've been hacked. It's not, you should never fear what you know. You should fear what you don't know. And we don't know of devices or medical devices that have been hacked. Why? Because they are stating it's natural causes because someone's got a disease. Anyone else see a problem with this? Or is it just me? Hey, this is my favorite, the, the, the denial of life attack. Come on, I've got some excellent names. You guys cannot complain. It, it feels like I'm like doing a horror show here. Is it that bad? <laughs> no one has died yet that we know of, so. <laughs> that we know of, you know, hypothetically. So, the other thing is when a device is in debug mode. So, I'm sorry, Dane, I'm gonna make an example of you again. I spoke at a conference, they tried to murder me. I'm still here, thankfully. Magnets are a big problem for medical devices. They interfere with communication. So, I'm at OXCon, they give me a badge, I wear it, because, you know, I'm proud, I'm a speaker. I start feeling ill, like really, like vomiting, and this is not pretty. I'm thinking, I'm not nervous. I'm like, what's going on? 
And you know, the thing starts pulling and I take it off. I'm like, oh, the bastards, they put magnets on. And it was a strong enough magnet to put my device into debug mode. So meaning, the signal got blocked and this thing decided now it's going to have an easy fit. It's going to throw a tantrum and pace me at a faster speed. So what happens when your heart beats fast? Your blood pressure goes up, you got sweaty, you get nauseous. And then we realize that if that is our sensitive, the communication protocols on those devices are, heaven help me when I go through a magnetic scanner. But that's also why you can't go through MRIs, except for the obvious that it will pull, pull it out of you and it will look like a horror show. It will effectively switch it off. Okay, so once you start interrogating the device, it's pretty much like a right pair. It's not going to say no. It's going to be there for the picking. It's like the lowest of low hanging fruit. So the message is identical, as I said, with most devices because a doctor doesn't want to have six or seven devices for each vendor. A single one for Medtronic, St. Jude's, Philips, all work on the same protocol. They can all authenticate on the same devices. So it would be pretty much like having all devices open with a single password. Not a good idea. And you don't need to be close because everyone says, yo, but if it's a pacemaker hack, I need to be close to you to do it. No, I think the furthest away was 50 meters. But if you've got Mike, is Mike in the room with his antennas, you know, I'm staying clear of him, he scares me. It's possible. Now, who would hack a medical device? Probably like 90% of the room. And I mean, it's murder, it's murder made easy. You don't have to stab someone. You don't have to be close to them. It's machine killing. And if you keep it alive for long enough, as I said, they, they, they estimate 48 hours of a denial of life attack, and your battery would just die. And there's no warning. There's no beacon that pops out and says, oh, I'm going to die soon. I won't know. Not that I want that. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to be walking in the street and have an alarm go off because my pacemaker is about to die. Because I probably would have a heart attack not related to my health issues. So basically what this means in this specific thing is that you can extend the window for the denial of life attack. So instead of being on for two hours, you can specify up to 72 hours. That's the cutoff. Never in my life have I seen a doctor that works 72 hours straight next to one single patient. So again, logic with security and development is just not there. But why? Because we use third party libraries. It's proprietary, but it's proprietary that we've bought from different libraries. Nothing is written specifically for that vendor. Okay, so these are some of the changes that a doctor can make to my device or any device. You can let the device beacon to identify itself. Who's seen Homeland's Broken Hearts? I tried to get the episode for you guys where they actually hacked the face making killed the president. It only happens in America, but it was pretty accurate. The research showed that that was probably one of the most accurate hacking scenes that Hollywood got right. You can beacon patient data, because again, nothing's encrypted. All my data is on this little device in my chest that says, Veronica Schmidt has got this disease, this is how we're pacing her, this is what happens, and this is who her doctor is. Hmm. Not information you want out there. Like I said, it discloses your cardiac data. It can change the patient's data. So when they check your pacemaker, the doctor would say, hey, okay, so this is what's wrong with you. But most doctors, as we all know, don't know each patient. And maybe in Bloom, because it's small, not a lot of people. But imagine if you change someone's disease or you shock them at a higher level. Now, if you shock someone and double the, the elect, you know, electricity that's needed, you're going to fry their heart muscle. No one really comes back from that kind of thing. It's not something they can cut off and replace. 
and you can reload the firmware. That's probably the biggest thing for me, is that you can actually make this to run whatever you want it to run. And this is not just, you know, if I haven't scared you enough, this is where the world's moving to an integrated city versus then eventually integrated internationally into one system. Yeah, I know this, it sounds like something, you know, that's going to be wonderful. This is going to be done by 2020. I think, as far as I know, Beijing's already started with the Olympics. And look, Walter Lee's presentation where he showed that looks like I want to live there. Until you just take a step back. And just think about some of the smaller elements of what we put out there. The internet is great, but the internet is not made for everything. There are just some things that should stay offline. Okay, so this is one of, it's a picture I found of a hospital room. This was very accurate. It was sitting in an emergency room for like eight hours waiting to be helped. And you start like scanning and listening for devices. I know it's not legal. I did not do it. It's hypothetical. Please, I, I cannot go to jail. This face, not going to work. Most of the devices are either on Wi-Fi or Bluetooth integrated with a tablet that the physician or the nurse has. Not password enabled. Hypothetically, I know this. Don't ask me why. I just know. Call it a gut feeling. Intu woman's intuition is the correct word, I think. So I know James told you guys ransomware is boring and stupid and... I kind of love it, because I've actually taken my poor machine, I know you guys are going to feel sorry for her, and like abused it on a live system, on a live network, to see what it does. Now if you can think that a device's firmware can be changed, without it throwing too much trouble your way, how long until we have the likes of Lockheed and Server mucked up? It's not jigsaw because it sucked. On a medical device. So I don't know if anyone has studied at Rhodes University. Okay, so some interesting conversations happen around the dinner table there. We discussed and did our own plan of ransomware. Now imagine this scenario. You ransomware the physician's machine. He infects his patients. You charge him a higher amount of Bitcoin versus the patient who then pays you monthly for use of their organs. Because if they're dead, they don't need them. It's a profitable market. It's not a good one. It's not ethical. It's not nice. We don't kill human beings. I just want to emphasize it. Please don't go killing someone. Now, I'm not going to take responsibility for that. So, there's our Cheney saying, you know, he might not have a heart of gold, but with his space maker, maybe he'll have a heart of Bitcoin. It's possible. These devices are powerful. Those lithium batteries and the processing capabilities are fairly good for a little computer with an antenna. Because that's effectively what's placed inside your body. So someone said to me, why would someone target healthcare? I don't know, because there's bad people on the internet and that's what they do. No. They've never been very secure. It's an unfortunate truth. It's a sad truth, but we know it. They haven't played catch up all too well. Okay, it's a high value target because they're going to want to fix things sooner rather than later because people are going to die. Healthcare data is lucrative. What is the biggest com commodity on the dark web? Information. Something that you can constantly sell. So, healthcare data is very important. It's an application-heavy environment. Because everything runs on a back end. You've got oncology, radiology, pathology, histology, and a lot of other ologies that I'm not even going to mention. There's just too many. And it uses out-of-date systems. Because most vendors have got specific chips that only run XP. Luckily, not older than that. I'm not sure I can remember days before XP, but that's just because I'm not that old. Sorry to those. And access is placed above security. We want to make it easy. Last thing you as an IT person needs is a nurse phoning and saying, you know, this workstation, I cannot remember my password, but I need to give a patient medicine. That's, for the, that's why IT places the sticky notes on. It's not the nurses. It's because we want to make it easy to access information. 
So these are some of the vulnerabilities that have been found in healthcare. It's not all hospitals are bad. There are some that are really doing some good work. There are some of it questionable, but we won't name names and disgrace people. Is there anyone working in healthcare? No one, so I'm not offending anyone. Any tomatoes? Anyone have any tomatoes? So I'm still safe. Okay, they're not really aware of network safety. If you ask a doctor, so is my pacemaker hackable? He rolls his eyes and says, no, but what kind of person would hack a pacemaker? And these, I'm not making this up. This is what I've been told. You know, monitoring and logging. It's fine to monitor and log, and sometime when you have time, you're going to look at these things, but then the incident has happened. So we're actively looking for things that have happened. We should be looking... You know, I don't even think hospitals do pen tests on medical devices. Maybe there's a business model for someone. That should be done. These devices should be pen tested. Collaboration is the biggest key in security. If we collaborate on code and we test these devices, we know what the weaknesses are. It's, it's the same. You know your enemy. At this stage, we don't know what the enemy is. We're waiting for it to happen. And obviously, we all know, I'm not, I don't even want to go into all of it, because these are things that everyone knows. But it is just, in healthcare, the main thing is they want access immediately. Again, if you employ security, you take away immediate access. But that's not the best thing. You know, everyone said Configa was dead, okay? <sighs> Hospitals got hit with it last year again. Why? Because they still didn't patch the vulnerabilities and they're still running legacy systems. As a hacker and a pen tester, what's the first thing you look for? Old vulnerabilities. And we know most devices aren't segmented in hospitals, so if you get to one, you get to another. Pivoting is your biggest tool within healthcare. Okay, to another pretty graphic to show how they hope to integrate everything. Okay, now the fun stuff. How I would do it. And I'm not saying it's the only way or the right way. It was the funnest way, you know. I, I kind of like get off on thinking how am I going to hack the hospitals and then going to them and telling them and then watching like that drop, you know, when a bomb drops. And it happens. So you circumvent the perimeter, which is, you know, Dane, this is stuff that you guys teach every day. Okay, so most of these things have got patient websites that you log in to say, how has your experience been? Those things are all in the wireless. And it's not like someone's going to peep over your shoulder and say, what are you doing? So you, once you circumvent that, you can pivot and you scan for internal connections. And you are, this is now the medical devices. And then you can just effectively scan to see what devices are out there. And we already know there's no username or password. We already know there's nothing that's going to stop you. It's not like there's a firewall on a morphine system or AV. Not that I think that would help, but those are probable possibilities that might happen. And you compromise the device. By, for example, your defibrillator machines in, in the ER are on the wireless LAN. Why? Because they're collecting statistics. They want to know that this machine, as a vendor, is optimally functioning. Now you have patient A. I've gotten into your network. I have compromised your device, and I've switched it off. So you can literally take it and go, it's going to happen. And effectively, a life is lost. The waiting room attack. So this worked in the cardiologist office as well by just sniffing the RF signals between the programmer and the devices. You could actually intercept them. I mean, that's done with a backpack on your back reading a book. Now, if you're in a waiting room 
and all these wireless devices are open. And they connected to the LAN on the hospital side. You can imagine one bad guy sitting there can effectively pivot around in your network. And this is probably the biggest problem, is that most websites are not very secure, or most internal systems used by hospitals are still open to old legacy hacks, effectively tricking the website to think you're a physician, and physicians have got high-level access, they can do anything, and you can effectively download data. Because they can. So while my mother-in-law was in hospital, I am ethical, so it was a clean USB. I just want to make that certain. Is a workstation. And you would think, okay, it's locked. It's not. It's open. And you would think, okay, so it's only going to have trusted devices. That's what makes sense. So who would like to guess what happened when I plugged my USB in? Exactly. So now can you imagine if I had one of my dodgy ones, Barry, and plugged that in? I don't think they would have liked me much. And these are the problems that healthcare is facing. But I think if they start taking these things off the Internet of Things, perhaps taking a step back and saying, okay, fundamentals in security, you know, let's apply those principles that we, that we were all taught not that hard. But the problem is they're facing legacy. Legacy is the nightmare in security that everyone faces. Now, it, it, I feel like I'm harping on it, but it is the problem we're facing. You know, some, a company's not going to go in and say, okay, I'm going to replace all my servers because it doesn't make sense. And finance doesn't want to spend money on IT and security because it's not really a cost center or doesn't bring in money. But then I must say there are companies that are spending the time on research. For example, my device, thank goodness for that, has got a fail-safe in. So it's got protected memory, and its firmware is in that memory section. So for you to change it, you effectively have to know where to write to. Okay, first strike, software block for two hours. Then, counter ticks. Second time, hardware brick. So that makes me feel a little bit better. doesn't make me feel better that they schneid me by saying it doesn't have a wireless controller when technically it does. It's just software switched off. But they need to fix the fundamentals. It comes back to that little thing that we've been taught. Not everything needs to be on the internet. You know, it's not like you undress yourself and place yourself on the internet. Well, I don't. Some people do. But it's the same thing. Your life is your most secure thing, okay? So for me to kill you now, I need to do something physically to you. So why, on God's green earth, trying to not swear, do you want to put your body on the internet where someone can root you because you have a medical device? It's the same with the Fitbits. There's been cases where that has been forensically used to put someone in jail. Someone's pacemaker data has been used to convict him because they said if you were running away, your heart would have sped up. You were calm while you were killing your wife. No. <laughs> Go read up. But it's, it's a real case. Generally, I don't think we know where to draw the line anymore. It's a new thing. The Internet of Things are out there. It's like a new toy. Everyone wants it. But common sense has to say, yeah, where do we draw the line? You know, everyone's in an uproar about AI and sentient beings coming to kill us. No, a hacker is going to come and kill you with your own medical device because you've put it on the internet. So, for me, the conversation needs to be, we now know what's wrong. How do we fix it? And that's collaboration between industries. It should not be a secret how my device is programmed, what the software is. Mary Mo, that's a PhD professor that does the same research, says you cannot have security in obscurity. And it is right. We need to be able to be open about it. The USB attack. What would happen if someone in an office block drops a USB and walks away? 
nine out of 10 people would put it in their machines. And this has happened in a hospital in Bloom. Not by me, I'm innocent. I want to maintain that. But someone spread malware in that man manner. And these are things that everyday criminals use. Okay, some interesting statistics is that 6.4 billion devices will be connected via the Wi-Fi by the end of this year, which is now a bit old. So that's 6.4 billion potential targets. It, it's getting interesting. This landscape is, you know, it's no longer in, in the previous days before my time, I suppose, you'd have like minimum landscape. You know, there's not a lot of devices on the internet. It was a commodity that was expensive unless your dad worked for telecom. That you had it from a young age. But it's becoming quite worrisome to me. By the end of 2020, they said it's 21 billion devices, and this includes medical devices. So most hospitals will effectively have gone wireless. 85% of the enterprises saying they're ready but only 10% are really confident. So are you going to visit a hospital and say, are you confident that you are safe and secure? What do you think they're going to say? We're unhackable because that's the trend. It's never going to happen to us. Okay. Way forward. It comes down to the vendors. It comes down to taking the vulnerable medical devices and actually fixing their problems. They need to figure out how to detect in real time. But we need to be proactive, not reactive. They need to be able to quickly respond and recover from attacks. But see, it's a double-edged sword. Because remote monitoring would enable us to know something's gone wrong but it's also going to enable an attacker to make things go wrong. So it's generally in life, you know, what is wonderful technologically can be used to your detriment. You know, I suppose whoever designed Stuxnet thought it was going to be very beneficial for them until it got out of control. It is always a double-edged sword. And firmware needs to be updated regularly. When last do you think generally most hospitals update medical equipment firmware? Every 36 months. So that's when the vendors come in to do maintenance. I can tell you though, firmware updates on pacemakers are fun. I had to have one. I had some software bugs. And it's not due to being with magnets. They decided that machine learning was a good thing to have in a pacemaker. I don't quite know yet why, so it learns from my heart what's wrong with my heart to fix it. No, the physician knows what's wrong with my heart. It should tell the pacemaker what it's supposed to do, and it should just do it. So the Sensio, you can just hear it from the name, is a smart pacemaker that does not work. And these things aren't cheap. I think it's 180000 for my one, thank goodness I've got medical aid. Otherwise, I would have to take out a bond on my house. And that's basically it. The horror show's over.